The Tom Woods Show, episode 784. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, I've just released another free ebook. This one called Education Without the State. Grab your copy at nostateeducation.com or by texting the word EDUCATE to 33444. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Very glad to be joined once again by my old friend Connor Boyack, who is president of the Libertas Institute in Utah, which is a state-level public policy think tank. And for today, we're going to be focusing primarily on his other major project, which is the Tuttle Twins series of books. Connor is the creator of that series. This is a series of children's books aimed at teaching libertarian ideas by taking a libertarian classic and turning it into a children's book. And he's done this for Bastiat's The Law. He's done it for the book by G. Edward Griffin, The Creature from Jekyll Island, about the Federal Reserve, if you can believe that. He's managed to do that. Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, and so on. Well, today is the release day for the fifth book in that series, based on Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom. So even if... You don't have any children. You have no intention of buying children's books. You're still going to enjoy this conversation because it's not just about kids. It's about these major ideas in this important work. So the Tuttle Twins version is called The Tuttle Twins and The Road to Serfdom. But theirs is spelled S-U-R-F-D-O-M for reasons we will get into in a moment. Connor, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Tom. Great as always to be with you. So you did not take my advice. You did not title the book... The Tuttle Twins Built the Roads. I still, I feel like that's a terrible missed opportunity, but all the same, I'm glad <laughs> that the book is out, and I'm glad that the series continues to do so well. So start off by telling people who don't know, which I hope will be a diminishing fraction of the of people listening, what the Tuttle Twins series is, what it's all about, and what you're doing in it. Yeah, I, I think you have so many repeat listeners. I'll be brief because they've probably heard it before, but the, the Tuttle Twins series is... Uh, us bringing the classic free market libertarian texts in our movement down to a child's level, or as I'm saying these days, a congressman's level. Um, the the age range is like five to ten, and so every book takes a classic text. We boil down the the principles that the book teaches about. We wrap it in a fun story. It's beautifully illustrated, and so the kids end up learning these ideas from a young age along with their siblings and even their parents, many of whom have never, of course, read these original books. So we're basically trying to teach uh, the principles of liberty to young kids uh, around the country and then through translating the books, which we're doing now, uh, the entire world. And you've – for each book, you've based it on some great classic work. So in the case of the current title – which is The Tuttle Twins and the Road to Serfdom, spelled S-U-R-F-D-O-M. I guess it's obvious enough which book you're talking about here. Yeah, so this is based on F.A. Hayek's uh, classic book written in the early 1940s, uh, The Road to Serfdom. Of course, he spelled it with a U. Um, he, in fact, well, based that on— He spelled on... it with an E. You spelled it with a U. Oh, did I say that backwards? It, yeah, that's okay. I'm sure everybody <laughs> knew. Yeah, he spelled it with an E. I apologize. So so he was actually taking that from a line in Alexis de Tocqueville's writings uh, where to, uh, de Tocqueville talked about the road to servitude. And so Hayek kind of played that up. He was in Britain at the time talking about the, the rise of fascism as a response to socialism and how this central planning would kind of lead the country or other countries that applied it in the wrong direction. Um, and that was uh, such a, a a well thought out book, but it's a, a dense book. I mean, I, I struggle to find people who've read that and like, yeah, I, I want to recommend this to everyone. Like for a lot of people, it's tough to get through, but the ideas of central planning and collectivism and the dangers he had were so important. So we wanted to do a book based on that. All right. So let's get into the weeds here. It's the Tuttle Twins as always, and they, they're always having some adventure. What does it have to do with I mean, of course, I know it has something to do with the Hayek book and the themes in the Hayek book, but it does also have to do with a road because you want to have that title make sense in this context. Right. So so lay out the storyline, then we'll get into the themes. Well, those who listened to the last episode I, I was on might remember that we did an April Fool's kind of gag uh, where Elijah, our illustrator, created a fake cover for April Fool's 
uh, earlier this year, uh, 2016, and it was the Tuttle Twins built the roads, right? This this standard libertarian, the, the fundamental question we all have to grapple with of who will build the roads. And we just put that out on, on April Fool's, and so many people responded so well to it, like, hey, you need to turn this into an actual book. So Elijah and I were, we were chatting on Messenger, we're like, holy cow, this is blowing up, like getting all these shares and likes, and maybe there's something there. And so, you know, I, I thought a lot about it, and and I think it's 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 challenging to say like how private roads will actually be built. That uh, you have to go really deep in the weeds and talk policy and yeah, no, I know that probably was asking a lot. I, I get that, but but man, you had the proof of concept exactly. right there with the people supporting it. No, I, and in fact, on your last episode, we had a lot of people email us, and and the vote was actually rather split between you know who will build the, the Tuttle Twins build the roads and and this concept of the road to serfdom and i thought you know the the title itself has the word road in it it's just begging to be you know used that way so we went that route but it actually the story developed really nicely uh, once we decided to go the route of the road to serfdom so at a high level what this story involves is uh, there's a beach named serfdom s u r f d o m um and so it's this fancy new beach kind of resort where the government has created all these attractions and everything. And then they have this master transportation plan where they've decided to build an actual road, a new road that takes people more easily to serfdom. Um, And so this book is a little different than the others where in some of the other books, it's been a little bit more lecture format where, you know, grandpa is kind of explaining the Federal Reserve or, you know, their neighbor Fred uh, is explaining the proper role of government and where our rights come from. This one, we wanted to be a little bit more observational or experiential where rather than just being taught by uh, a wise adult, uh, the twins are experiencing firsthand. They're, they're observing all of the effects that this road is having on the community around. And so they have an uncle, uh, they're at this family reunion at the beach, and they have an uncle who's a reporter. We actually modeled this after Ben Swan. So Ben and his family have a, a very prominent role uh, in, in this book, and that was fun. He's, he's really excited. Um, and so Ben helps Ethan and Emily, the twins, kind of figure this out. And so they go around and they're observing all the effects that this road is having in causing, you know, for example, the road is, is uh, they use eminent domain. The government steals the, the land, right? And so they use eminent domain. Well, what's that? We explain it. And it goes straight through this old dairy farm uh, because that's where the government wanted to, to build the road. And so what does that ha- cause to happen? Well, the dairy farmer suddenly can't graze his cattle as well, um, and so he ends up selling uh, the property. Well, because there's no more dairy farm, the historic creamery uh, on the other side of town has to shut down because they're not getting the local supply they want. It's more economical for them to move, and so all these people that can't move are out of jobs, and so on and so forth. And so the twins go through the story seeing the effects And through observation, realize that the unintended consequences of central planning are numerous. uh, They're rarely anticipated, uh, but they're very real uh, to the people who are affected by them, including the very people who supported the original central planning. So we include at least one guy who, you know, voted for the transportation plan. He really liked the idea, but now he's being affected by it, you know, once it's being put in action and suddenly his eyes are opened uh, to the negativity of of that central planning. So this is more a book where the twins are going through the actions, going through the story rather than just being talked to uh, by a wise adult. So we wanted to toy with this different model where I think that's important with central planning is that we learn to observe its effects. Bastiat talked about how a good economist can foresee not only the visible and intended consequences, but also the unintended consequences. So helping kids recognize that and develop that skill. And I like the fact that the book actually uses the term central planning. And you think, how are they going to understand that? But I like the way the book defines central planning for kids. It's when a few people make decisions for everybody. In a way, I think that's a pretty technically rigorous definition of central planning. (laughs) That's actually pretty darn good. So that means that not only will they get the story and they'll get the idea that there are all these I hate to say unintended consequences because I think sometimes these jerks do intend the exactly. consequences. But, but, right. but you know what I mean. You know, they, they'll recognize all the different unexpected ways that one example of central planning can affect a whole lot of people. But they'll also be familiar with the important term central planning. So it's all very good from the point of view of getting children 
aware of stuff like this without bashing them over the head, without making them read John Galt's speech for 40 pages. You talk <laughs> about another term that basically no kid, unless it's one of my kids, has ever heard, and that's eminent domain. Right. And that principle is described here, too. So we don't want to scare kids that – at any moment, the government can just come and take your, your house. So how are you handling that? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, this is a special case where this guy had a lot of land and it stood right in the way of, you know, where they wanted to build the road. The The likelihood that it happens to any one person is wrong. But what we're really trying to provoke here is the, the inherent sense of justice that kids have, right? Like all children have been taught from a young age that stealing is wrong or that you shouldn't hurt people and so forth. And so when you present them at a young age, real world examples of how stealing has been quote unquote legitimized, what I found with the earlier books in the series, um, when I read this book with my own kids as I was working on it, it, it definitely resonates with them at a very raw uh, level that they can understand. Like, why is that okay? Like, how how is that acceptable? Why is it that you guys as adults teach us that we can't steal, but suddenly like the government can? That just doesn't make any sense. And obviously, there are many arguments that adults have made up to try and justify uh, the the legalization of, of that theft. But um, it's it's fun to give these examples to kids because they can see from a very basic level, at least how complex the world or nuanced the world is. It's not just, Hey, everything we teach you as kids, you know, applies as adults. Uh, you know, it's rainbows and unicorns and these, these simple moral lessons we teach you, everyone follows as adults. Well, no. Um, and it, so it begins to open their eyes to exceptions that adults make, uh, provoke conversations in families over dinner, about these concepts, even with young kids. It's so fun for us to get emails from readers talking about the conversations they're having with like their eight-year-old kid about something like eminent domain. And then not only that, but they relate often how that spins out into kind of, uh, you know, tertiary uh, or tangential issues closely related where the adults find themselves having these substantive conversations about interesting policies and principles with their kids that they never would have had. And so this is more – I mean it's not like we're trying to teach them eminent domain for dummies and are trying to be so conclusive about it. Our goal is to really just provoke those conversations and give parents an opportunity to um, expose their children to these ideas like you say – these kids wouldn't have been getting in anywhere else. So we're not trying to be so definitive and conclusive about everything that if you know they read the book, all of a sudden they've learned everything there is to know. This is just a way to kind of get a foot in the door for parents to start to have these discussions with their kids and provide them a perspective that those kids probably would not have gotten anywhere else. And you can take the story in this book and apply it to current events, of course, really just drawn right from the day's headlines. You can even – have generated discussion about the recent election. Of course, we're talking eight days after the 2016 election. So this is – this. remember, everybody, this is the official release date of this book. It is available as of today. You are hearing about it. You're among the first people to hear about it, let's say. And you could easily say that the people running for president, the two major party candidates, are an example of exactly the sort of phenomenon that this book is warning about. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so often parents feel, in my conversations at least, parents feel helpless. Like, what can they do? You know, what? How have we come to this point? And and I think it's a fair uh, characterization, a fair conclusion to say that so much of our problem stems from the education that today's voters have received, or you know, the lack thereof. I'm, I'm very critical of our modern. Uh, government education system, and especially when you look at, um, I, I I'm a big fan of collecting uh, textbooks over time. I always try and find it at used bookstores. You know how what did a, a high school you know economics class or history class used to talk about? Compare it to a textbook today, and when you see how dumbed down things have become, and how uh, many important things are being completely omitted, and how books and and textbooks and the like are being used for agendas in today's schools, parents have been so appreciative to us 
to try and push back against that because, you know, maybe they can't homeschool or they, you know, don't, they're not well enough to do a, a well off enough to do a private school or whatever. Um, and so of necessity, you know, so many parents are putting their kids in these schools, but they're, they're, you know, free market minded, liberty minded, conservative, whatever. And they're very frustrated and scared that their kids are going to get for lack of a better word, indoctrinated um, and be part of the trend that we see today with how voters are, are tending to behave. And so this is our attempt to try and we, we like to use the term uh, give kids a, a foundation of freedom um, so that they have kind of a foundation against which they can check a lot of those contrasting ideas that they're going to expose to, whether they're in public school or just out with friends or or in the different circles that they go through uh, throughout life. But yeah, I, I think today's problems are just symptoms of a much uh, bigger underlying problem that we have to address through education. What do you think the relevance of the road to serfdom is today? And I preface this with my own view, and I, I hope I'm not undermining your book, as the children's book, I think, is really those are the themes everybody needs. I think the actual, uh, the original road to serfdom has a lot of material in it that's really out of date today, that's not relevant. We don't have really anybody calling for the state ownership of the means of production. So all that stuff is not really relevant. So what you've done is actually distill what is relevant out of that book and put it into your children's book. Now, do you want to make some kind of defense of the road to serfdom against me? Because I, I honestly don't I'm, – I, I wouldn't recommend it as one of my top 100 books for people to read, but I would recommend The Tuttle Twins and the Road to Serfdom as one of the kids that uh, – one of the books I would want kids to read, and my own kids are going to read it as soon as we get a hard copy. Yeah, I, I think you're right, and and I think part of the reason is is the same critique I have of Frederick Bastiat's The Law, for example, where when I've recommended that book, sometimes people struggle with all the stuff he puts in there about France. You know, we just don't have the context, and we don't know who Monsieur So and So is, and Bastiat is critiquing these various different programs that were uh, going on. And so, rather than being a more abstracted discussion of of principles and ideas. In his case, only a little bit. He's he's addressing very specific things, and and Hayek, uh, to a large degree, is addressing very specific things in his day. Again, he's writing in the early 1940s. He's in Britain. He's seeing a very uh, specific problem in his country where uh, many people were believing that the rise of fascism was a, a capitalist response to socialism. He's addressing very specific uh, legal uh, legislative proposals, acts of parliament, um, and so it definitely is couched. In in uh, his world, his day, and the things that were happening. And so for that reason, I found it's tough to uh, recommend it because people have to first learn the history uh, before they can really understand his application of, of, of principles. But that book, I think he has so many good one-liners and good uh, you know, prescriptions to the issues that were going on that if they can be abstracted and pulled out of there, uh, it becomes a, a very useful and important thing. Of course, for those who don't know, uh, Hayek uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, for for economics. He, he's got a good good name ID outside of our movement. He just gets that aura of, of respectability. Um, and so we really try to abstract out of that book, the, the key principles that certainly do apply to our day, where someone doesn't have to go read history and understand what you know Britain in the 1940s was like to really slog through a book written by this esteemed economist, um, we can begin to understand those principles and think more appropriately or, or without as much uh, mental energy how they apply to our world today, which they definitely do. And so that's kind of the approach we've tried to take with this book is take the key ideas, uh, give a little throwback to Hayek because it was an important work. You know, millions of copies have been printed. It was it was impactful in its day, uh, but we can definitely learn uh, from what he was talking about and apply it to our world. Let's talk about your series in general. You have – this is the fifth book in the series. Right. So let's just recap. You've covered The Law by Bastiat. You've covered I, Pencil, the great essay by Leonard Reed. You've covered, and this is a huge distillation. You've covered uh, the creature from Jekyll Island and made that into a uh, into a book. Uh, what's the one I'm forgetting? The Henry Hazlitt was our fourth. Um, the uh, economics in one lesson, and that one's harder to remember because we didn't incorporate it into the title. That's the one book in our series so far where we haven't. What was uh, the title of that one? Uh, that was the Tuttle Twins and the Food Truck Fiasco. That's right. Yep. That's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we talked about that. It's so all about protectionism. Right. So we talked about that. And now this this fifth title, the Tuttle Twins and the Road to Serfdom, my understanding is there is a sixth title that is rolling around in your head. And 
last time you were on to talk about one of these books, you spilled the beans about book number five on the show. And so I'd like to see if we can continue that tradition here, <laughs> if, if I can twist your arm. So what's the sixth book? I, I actually don't even know myself is what the sixth book is. So you feel like telling me on the air? Yeah, you know, Tom, you've been very good to me over the years and helping spread the word of the series. And so I'm, I'm definitely excited to share that uh, first uh, with your listeners and with you, um, we plan 10 books in the whole series. That's been our plan from from the outset. Once we published the first book, which was just a test, you know, we, we had no clue what the response would be. We thought perhaps we would only do one book, and that's why we chose The Law, uh, because for Elijah, the illustrator, and myself, that was like the most important book in our own uh, education and progression in this movement. So we said, you know, if nothing else, let's produce this book. But the response has been great, so we decided to continue. We're going to do 10 books total. Um, as you say, this is the, the fifth book uh, that just comes out today. The sixth book is uh, one that I imagine many people haven't read. Um, but for me, it was my introduction into the liberty movement. I was watching a documentary in 2005. It was a private screening. The documentary was America, Freedom to Fascism by Aaron Rousseau, and uh, the late Aaron Rousseau, I should say. And I was not in our movement. I didn't understand these ideas, but I was invited there. And I watched that documentary, and it was kind of a, a you know, review of the decline of America. And there was this guy in there who made a lot of sense this old guy. And I thought, I'm going to go look that guy up. Well, that guy was Ron Paul. And uh, I was heading to Africa on a service trip uh, that summer. Right before I left, I bought a book. I bought one of Ron Paul's books. It's actually a compilation of his speeches. It's called A Foreign Policy of Freedom. And it's a, a brown book. It's a compilation of a bunch of speeches he's given in Congress uh, over the years on the issue of foreign policy and non-intervention and so forth. And I read that on the plane ride over to Africa and underlined the heck out of that thing. I mean, I was just blown away as a, a newcomer uh, to these ideas and just, you know, got back, watched every YouTube video I could find of this guy and, you know, supported his campaign and the rest is history. Now, so that book, we're, we're basing our Tuttle Twins book on the foreign policy of freedom, but really we're pulling out of there the key ideas. And so this is going to be a book to teach kids about the non-intervention, uh, no, excuse me, the non-aggression principle, um, and the golden rule. And then we're going to couch it a little bit in terms of foreign policy as well to talk about non-intervention as just an extension of the non-aggression principle. So fundamentally, this book is going to be teaching kids about the NAP, uh, not the kind that they've known for years, but, you know, the other kind. Um, and so we really wanted to, to include those principles. There hasn't been a really good book in our movement that just talks about the non-aggression principle. In fact, you may remember, Tom, I reached out to you a couple months ago. I talked to several other folks as well trying to say, hey, guys, is there just a, a book on the non-aggression principle, like a really good book that I'm just not aware of that I haven't come across? And everyone kind of collectively shrug their shoulders, you know, oh, a little bit here and a little bit there. And Rothbard talks about it in this chapter of this book or whatever. Um, and the more I thought about it, I realized, you know, Ron Paul's book and frankly, his whole career is one of educating people about the non-aggression principle. That book has huge personal value for me. Um, and anyone who reads it is going to be very well educated. Uh, those issues, unlike Hayek's book, are definitely still relevant to our day. And so that's uh, Tuttle Twins 6, tentatively titled uh, The Tuttle Twins and the Golden Rule. Wow, that is excellent. Holy cow, that is really, really important and good. Well, I can't wait for Do you have an estimate as to when it'll be done? Yeah, uh, current timing, we're thinking probably April of 2017. All right, take one minute to tell us about your initiative with schools, which is very interesting. Oh, yeah. Thanks uh, for bringing that up. So uh, Tuttle Twins, the, the series has spread very well through word of mouth and, and you know, we do conventions and some social media campaigns. Uh, but as we've sat back, we've realized, you know, there's a huge market and huge missed opportunity if we're not in the schools. And so we're deciding uh, to take the Tuttle Twins and the Miraculous Pencil, the book about the free market, which is politically benign. Um, and we're going to start placing that directly into schools. And so if any of your listeners 
are teachers of elementary school age students or if uh, any of them, if you guys know any teachers uh, that, that teach kids, maybe grades two to five roughly, uh, send them to tuttletwins.com slash school. And that's where we have a landing page where teachers can sign up. We will give teachers a free lesson plan. More importantly, we will send free copies of the Tuttle Twins and the Miraculous Pencil, one for every single student. Oftentimes, programs like this, they'll send like a classroom set that's designed to just stay in the classroom so that kids, uh, as they you know progress through that class over the years, can get it. We're not doing that. Uh, these books are designed for the kids to take home, to keep reading, keep learning. Um, and then, of course, the benefit for us is that uh, the parents will learn about the book. They'll learn about the whole series. We'll give them some information on how they can get the rest of the series. And so that's how we'll expose a lot more kids to these ideas. But we're going to be providing thousands and thousands of copies of the Tuttle Twins and the Miraculous Pencil for free around the country. Uh, so all teachers need to be pointed to TuttleTwins.com slash school. There is no curriculum that teaches about the free market. Um, spontaneous order, you know, economic harmony, uh, collaboration, competition, nothing like that. It's not in Common Core. It's not in textbooks. Um, and so we've done some early testing with some teachers who are phenomenally excited about this. Um, and so it's a great opportunity for us to begin to insert ourselves in a process where kids are not only not being taught this stuff, but they're being taught contrary ideas. Um, and so TuttleTwins.com slash school is where anyone can find out more information. And then for this book we've talked about today, uh, the Road to Serfdom, our brand new book that comes out today, that is at TuttleTwins.com slash serfdom. And whether you spell it with a U or an E, it'll take you to the same book, uh, TuttleTwins.com slash serfdom. And by the way, if you use coupon code WOODS, uh, we'll give you 25% uh, off of that book through the end of the week. Wow, that is really good. All right, so definitely make sure and use that coupon code, TuttleTwins.com. I'll link to all this at TomWoods.com slash 784. Well, good luck with the book, Connor, as always, and congratulations. Thanks very much, Tom. Appreciate it as always. All right, everybody, TuttleTwins.com is where to go for those books, so definitely check that out. What else can I tell you? Lou Rockwell's coming up on the show tomorrow, so make sure and check him out. Also, remember... My affiliate contest is coming up. LibertyClassroom.com is my flagship product where libertarians can learn the history and economics that was kept from us in school, taught by professors you can trust and listen on the go. Great, great product. Everybody loves it. It's been around four and a half years, a proven concept, and it's a product you can promote with confidence. Well, during my affiliate contest, not only do you get the standard 50% commissions if somebody buys Liberty Classroom through your link, which I give you. But if you're one of my top 10 affiliates, I'm giving away prizes, cash prizes, or in the case of the first prize, a brand new car. So if you're not participating in this, you're not promoting through social media or your blog or whatever, then what the heck's the matter with you? It's free money. Might as well do it. So check it out at woodscontest.com. I will not be happy until I have stuffed your pocket with affiliate commissions and possibly a cash prize or, and this won't really fit in your pocket, a new car. Woodscontest.com. Check that out. Lou Rockwell tomorrow. See you. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.